grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Words we just heard today, spoken over Connor in his baptism, and the very same words spoken over all baptized believers of the Christian faith. The very same words spoken over you. Now there's a lot of meaning to those words. We just sung about a little bit of that meaning. That is when God's name is placed upon you and there is no more secure place to be than under the protection of the name of God. But it means even more than that. These words in baptism, they denote a death. They mean new life. They mean a permanent adoption into God's family. Did you know that? That baptism is tied to both death and life, both to an ending and a beginning. Well, in our gospel reading today, John the Baptist has come to prepare the way for the Lord, and he comes preaching a baptism, but it isn't the same baptism that you have received. He comes pe preaching a baptism of repentance. And so his ministry begins to prepare the way for the coming of Jesus. But this is the beginning of what becomes the baptism that you have received. The baptism where the name of the triune God is placed upon you, is spoken over you when that water is applied to your head. And God does some supernatural and amazing things through that water and that word. So how do we get to our baptism, the joyous promises of forgiveness and life forever? Well, let's look at the text. Now, John is the first person to receive word from God in about 400 years. So that little verse that is easy to gloss over is pretty significant. This is the time between Malachi, which was our Old Testament reading, and the beginning of the New Testament in the scriptures. And there's believed to be about a 400-year period of time in between where there is no word from God. And yet now we are told the word of the Lord has come to the son of Zechariah in the wilderness, John the Baptist. So God is on the move again. And he brings in John the Baptist to be sort of the last in the line of the Old Testament prophets. He's the last in all of those men sent to the people of God to give them the word of the Lord. And what is John here to say? What is the word from God? It is nothing short of a new dawn is breaking, a new era is beginning, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In other words, the Messiah, the promised Savior who was promised all the way back in the Garden of Eden just after the fall into sin is about to arrive. I mean, that's where the name of our season of Advent comes from. Advent means coming or arrival, that we are anticipating and preparing for the coming of the promised Savior. So imagine, put yourself into the mind of the people listening to John. They've been waiting for the Messiah for a long time, and he is bringing the word of the Lord that the Messiah is about to be here. And John's job is to prepare those people to receive the Messiah. His goal is to get people to repent, or the literal meaning of that in the Greek is to be turned. Right? If we're turned and focused on the world and our own lives and the things that we want, we're going to miss the Messiah. And so God sends John the Baptist to turn people to Christ, to be turned away from themselves and away from their own desires and wants, away from their sins, and to Jesus to be able to receive him. And the first step in being prepared in the ministry of John the Baptist is submitting to his baptism of repentance. And by doing this, this is pretty significant. 
Because what this would mean is that the Jewish person who's submitting to the baptism of John is that they are it believing the word of the Lord that's come to him and acknowledging the ending of an era and the beginning of a new one. They're acknowledging the presence of the oncoming of Christ and the new covenant. And you'll notice in the text that he specifically calls out two groups who reject his baptism, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they reject it because they are the religious leaders of the day and they don't want the era to end. They're not ready for the Messiah to come and change things. They're very focused on the law and doing the work of the temple and the sacrifices and everything in the old covenant. But now a new covenant is coming in Christ. And so the first step is submitting to this baptism of repentance, acknowledging the word of the Lord, believing that what John the Baptist says is true. And this denotes exactly with what John the Baptist says. He tells them, don't rely on the fact that Abraham is your father. Right? That was the basis for the covenant in the Old Testament. It was made with Abraham and his offspring. And now this new covenant is coming, and John the Baptist's word from God is, I can make children of Abraham from these stones. This new covenant is coming to fulfill the old covenant in a way that's never been seen. So John says, repent. Turn away from these things. Don't rely on your heritage in Abraham. Don't rely on your good deeds or following the law because the axe is at the root of the trees. And if you don't bear fruit in keeping with repentance, the tree will be cut down. Pretty stark stuff. I mean, when Jesus talks about John the Baptist, he said, what did you expect when you came out into the wilderness? This is a wild guy. He's not going to be some soft dude. He's preaching some serious stuff here. And so the crowds ask sort of the question that you would ask after being warned that the time is drawing close. you got to repent. Otherwise, that tree, and they probably understood the tree was them, is going to get cut down. What do we do then? How do we do this to avoid what you are describing? So the crowds ask, what then shall we do? They want to know how to bear this fruit of repentance. They want to know how to avoid this judgment. And notice that the two groups of people that step forth specifically, they aren't the prominent figures, especially not the prominent figures in Jewish life. In fact, they are government officials, the tax collectors and the soldiers. And at this time, they wouldn't have been Jewish people, most likely. They would have been Romans or Greeks, the tax collectors and the soldiers. And they come up and they ask the same question, and what is John's response? He says, well, if you've got multiple tunics, give one to those who have none. And to the tax collectors, he says, don't take more than you're owed. Be honest in your work. And he says the same to the soldiers. Don't extort people through threat of violence or false accusations, but be content with the wages you receive. In other words, he's giving them vocational charges. He's telling them what their calling is in their jobs and to do that faithfully and lawfully. And here you might be thinking, okay, so I guess to avoid the judgment of God, I've got to do good things. I've got to do the right works. But remember again that the baptism that John is advocating here is not the baptism you received. We're not quite there yet. And his purpose isn't to bring about the forgiveness of your sins and the salvation in the eyes of God but to prepare you to receive it. And so he wants you to turn away from your former way of life. Turn away from what you relied on for your security in that old way of life. And be ready to receive the one who does bring the forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. So John is preaching with authority, and he's preaching a baptism, and he's, he's making some waves People are hearing him, they're listening to him, and they are submitting to his baptism. Notice before the tax collectors and, and soldiers come up, it says, after they were baptized, they, said, they then ask these questions. 
And so people began to ask among themselves and within their hearts, is John the Baptist the promised one? Is he the Messiah? Is he the Christ? And John's answer is no, he's not. But his answer tells us a couple of things. The way he answers, he makes it clear that he isn't even worthy to do the lowliest task of the servant in the master's house, which is removing the master's shoes. So he's not even worthy to do that. Plus, there's another really cool scriptural connection. In Ruth chapter 4, there's an old custom in Israel, and I'll read a little bit of that for you that's related to this sandal imagery. Now, this was the custom in former times concerning redeeming and exchanging to confirm a transaction one drew off his sandal and gave it to the other, and this was the manner attesting in Israel. So when the Redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, he drew off his sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you have witnessed this day that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belongs to Elimelech and all that belonged to Chilon and to Malin. So the removal of the sandal is actually the price a signif signifying the price being paid for the redemption of what's being purchased. And John's answer is saying here, I can't even get the shoe off, much less pay the price needed for the redemption that is required. And the second thing he specifically highlights is that he only baptizes with water. He only baptizes with water, but the one who is coming after him, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. In other words, the baptism of John is not sufficient on its own. It's just something to prepare you to receive the real promise. So how does this relate to the baptism for Connery Witness today and your own baptism? How did we get there? Well, see, at the beginning of Luke, John kicks off this journey to Jerusalem. He begins to pave the way for Jesus' ministry, which goes to Jerusalem, and he knows he's going to Jerusalem from the very beginning to pay that price, because he can, to buy us back, to redeem us in the eyes of God. And John the Baptist is helping kick that journey off by turning people, by being turned toward Christ when he arrives. And we know this because in the very next few verses right after our gospel reading today is the baptism of Jesus himself. He binds himself to us by being baptized by John the Baptist, instituting the waters of baptism for what is to come in his ministry. And the cool thing is that each of us are also making a journey to Jerusalem. Now, I'm not talking about an actual pilgrimage, although if you've been to Jerusalem, it's pretty cool, I hear. But the journey, the spiritual journey that's going on in our hearts. And John the Baptist is no longer our guide, but the Holy Spirit. And that journey for us begins in the waters of baptism. And the promise of God being applied to us. The Holy Spirit being given. When we submit ourselves to the baptism, not simply of repentance, but a death to the old self and a new life in Christ. A life that is perfect, whole and clean and eternal. John's baptism is not our current baptism because what we are now baptized into as far as Luke 3 is concerned, has not yet occurred. The promise and the covenant that we are baptized into has not yet happened. The Holy Spirit has not yet been given to the church, nor has the fire of God's wrath been poured out on Jesus. For that is what you and I are baptized into. That is what Connor was just baptized into. Remember, John said, he will baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And this is echoed by Paul in Romans chapter 6. 
He says, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. This is the baptism that John was preparing God's people for. This was the mission of Christ, the promised one. And as you can tell today, as we got to witness a baptism and the work of the Lord in it, Jesus accomplished all of the things he was sent to do. There's another layer at work here as well. In worship, we relive this journey each week. Think about it for a moment. Dying to self in submission in the confession of our sins. Done in preparation to be turned to Christ to receive the gift of forgiveness of sins, which he so graciously desires to give us. Submission to hearing and being guided by God's word in preparation to examine ourselves and in repentant faith for having been turned to receive the fruits of the cross. This is your baptismal identity in Jesus. Yet another one of the many myriad reasons that the season of Advent, the preparation for the arrival of the promised Savior, is a season of joyful anticipation. Because what he has come to bring is greater than anything that has been done before or since. Nothing short of purchasing you from sin, death, and the devil. Joining you to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus by placing the name of God on you in your baptism. And this isn't a promise of your faithfulness to him. When we're baptized, we're not committing ourselves to Christ but God is committing himself to you. He is saying, you are mine. I'm placing my name on you. You belong to me. What a fitting theme for the second Sunday in Advent. We're kicking off this journey with John. Preparation. A baptism of repentance to turn us to Christ. The one who is coming. Because what he has to bring, you don't want to miss. It's not a mere baptism of water, nor is it a baptism only of repentance. But it is a baptism of death to the old Adam, sin, the devil, and this world. And brand new, eternal, perfect life in Jesus. So now he has come. You no longer merely have a water baptism but one of the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, amen. May the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus in the very promise you have received from him in your baptism. For the one who has made that promise to you is faithful. May that faith in him guard you until he comes again to make all things new. Amen.